Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. The woman which hath a husband is bound by the law and her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another. Wherefore, my brethren, be, uh, brethren ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth the fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead we're in, we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit and not the oldness of the letter. For what shall I say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. I, for I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. This morning I want to speak to you a few minutes about walking in the newness of the spirit uh, there in verse 6 talking about serving the newness of the spirit let's pray Father we thank you for this morning and Lord the privilege we have to read the word of God and Father we thank you so much for Jesus who died for our sin and Father we thank you for that and that we can have life and life everlasting and Father, that we can walk in newness of spirit. And Father, we ask you to bless the message this morning. Give us the things that we would have us to realize from the word of God. And we'll ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Of course, this is the time of year we think about New Year's resolutions. Of course, we know about New Year's resolutions. Uh, they, they, the new wears off pretty quick. Uh, we make them and... For too long, we forget about them or we don't hold on to them. You know, uh, everybody's usually the first year going to start a diet and that doesn't last very long and we're going to stop doing this and we're going to start doing that. And the problem with making changes in life is change in life is not something you just do at the first of the year. If you're going to make a change that's going to last and you're going to make a change that will make a difference in your life, it's something you must take on and make sure that you do every day of every week, of every month, of every year. Because if you don't, it won't change. Sooner or later, you'll stop doing it. And that's the reason, uh, you know, diets don't last because we don't stay with them and we don't stick to them. And that's the reason our New Year's resolutions fall by the wayside, wherever, whatever they may be, is because we don't take it with the mindset that it's something we have to make a part of our life and make a part of our life every day, not just the first of the year, or the first month of the year, but all year long the rest of our life. Uh, you have to make changes. So if we're going to walk in the newness of, of spirit and the newness of life, the Bible also talks about walking in the newness of life, we have to make sure that the changes we decide to make in our life it's something we're going to do continually. And the first one, to walk in the newness of life and spirit, we must remember we cannot continue in sin. And this is what Paul's talking about here, that, that we're dead to sin. And this morning, if you're here and you're lost, I'm here to tell you, you continue in sin with no hope of having any dominion or power over sin. The Bible says that we're bound by sin, that we're sinners by nature. And we don't have any other thing that we do. Uh, we just act naturally. We're just natural sinners. But I'm glad this morning you can have that newness of spirit, that newness of life. If you'll come this morning, let us take the word of God and not show you how to be a Baptist, not show you how to be anything else. We'll show you how to be a child of God and born again in the spirit of God. That's what it takes. I've said this over and over. 
It's not the name on the door that's going to get you to heaven. It's the name that's in your heart that gets you to heaven. Uh, you can call yourself anything you want. There'll be many a Baptist fall off a of Baptist pew straight in the pits of hell because they're, they're depending on the Baptist church to get them to heaven. Baptist church will not get you to heaven. Or any other name church you want to name will not get you to heaven. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. You either have Jesus in your heart or you don't have anything. So remember, we can't continue in sin. The Bible tells us that God and sin can't be together. So we have to have our sin penalty paid for and our sin penalty washed away and our sin penalty cleansed in order to be with God. The great thing is, it says here, that we're dead to sin. Sin no longer has the effect on me that it used to. The Bible says that the law of sin, the wages of sin, is death. And death means separation from God. There's only two places to be, heaven or hell. God's in heaven, so that tells me the other place. And it doesn't have that effect on me. Thank God when I accepted Christ, he said, I give unto you eternal life. I don't have to worry about that anymore. So I'm dead to sin. It does not have any effect. If you want to read the rest of chapter 7, uh, Paul deals with that quite a bit. And all through Romans. Because dead people, what are you going to do to them that will affect them? If I fell over dead this morning in the platform, fell over there on the pew, if you come kick me in the head, would I care? Would it affect me a bit? If you twisted my neck around the backwards or you broke my arm, or you say, no, you're a dead preacher. You're not even there. It don't make any difference. That's the way we are to sin now. Not that I'm free from it, because I still have to live with it every day of my life in this old world. But sin will no longer send me to hell. It won't affect me. It's, I'm dead to it that way. Sin no longer has the effect on me to do what it used to to send me to hell. Remember that grace will much more abound than sin. He talks about grace abounding over and over in the book of Romans. How that grace covers my sin. No matter how big and dirty and ugly your sin may be, God's blood and His grace is greater and will cover that sin. There's uh, one drop of blood is all it takes to cover the sin of the whole world, and He shed all of His blood. So there's an abundant supply this morning. Grace will cover our sin, and we'll continually, and that's the reason the Bible talks about us praying daily. How do we cover our sin with grace? How do we get the blood of Christ applied to our sin? We have to ask him daily to do that. Those of us who know the Lord, why is that important to you? If you study the scripture and you know your Bible, the only sin you'll ever have to answer for is the one you haven't confessed and asked forgiveness for. All the rest of them, he said, when you confess our sins, he is just and able to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and cast them as far as the east is from the west, never to be brought against us again. That's why it's important that you have uh, that grace applied to your sin. Then here's the key to it. We no longer should be continuing sin and walk in the newness of life. And to do that, you just can't walk in sin. I know where my sin lies, and I have to stay away from it. Don't walk in sin. Walk in the Spirit. Jesus over and over told us, walk in the Spirit and be guided by the Spirit, directed by the Spirit in our life. And if we'll do that, we'll not walk in sin. When do we get in trouble spiritually? How do we wind up in sin? Paul talks about also here in chapter 7 about the war in our members. There's a daily battle between your spirit and your flesh. And when it's just those two, it's a standoff. Who guess who makes the deciding vote who wins that day? You do. You're the one that makes the decision. Am I going to let the Lord and follow the Lord and walk in the Spirit today and let God have His rule and way in my life, or am I going to walk in the flesh and let the devil have His way in my life? You make that decision every day. We can't walk in sin. You know, it's funny that people think they can be a Christian and continue to walk in the sin they've always been in. You can't do that. It's kind of like saying, well, you know, you can put a, if you put a whole barrel of good apples in with a bad apple, that bad apple will turn good. 
No, we know that's not true. You put all those good apples in with the bad apple, the bad apple rubs off on the good ones and they turn bad. I'm here to tell you, if you're a Christian and you hang around and walk in sin, the sin's going to rub off on you too. Stay away from it. Secondly, to walk in newness of life, we must remember our baptism. What's the important thing about baptism? Baptism won't get you into heaven either. Baptism has nothing to do with your salvation. Baptism is a picture of what happened. Two things. The old man that was there is dead and buried with Christ. The new man is raised in the likeness of his resurrection. And it's also a picture of the washing away of your sin. Remember that we owe a debt that we can't repay, Paul said. And that we have a baptism and we've showed the world and we've showed and said to God that we were out of sin. It's a sin, a sign of the symbol of the old man being buried. One of the things that we don't do much, unless it's a thing of the law we need to, once we bury somebody and put them in the grave, just bury my dad Wednesday. I'm not going to go dig him back up. Sometimes the law has to do that, but as of the rule of thumb, we're not going to go dig him up. Why is it then we as Christians, when we bury the old man, we want to turn around and dig him back up? Leave him buried. That's where he belongs. Walk in the newness of life. Let that new man rule. Quit digging up the old man and dragging him around. Got to keep that old sinful man buried. Remember, we're a new man. Remember, the Bible tells us that all things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. We got to keep that new man in present place and in our statutes and in our walks and in our thoughts. And remember that Christ raises us up to something better than sin. We always have to walk in the newness of life. We don't want to walk in that old way. There's something wrong if you say, well, you know, I enjoy walking the old way than the new way. There's something wrong. You better be checking on what you got because whatever you got wasn't what you were supposed to. Because my Bible says if you got salvation and you got saved, that there ought to be a desire to live for the Lord and some change in your life. If you can go right back doing what you were doing the way you were doing it and nothing bothers you, you didn't get something right. Better be checking. Thirdly, to walk in the newness of life and spirit, we have to keep the old man in his place. Jesus said what? Take up your cross and follow me daily. There's a reason for that. What's the purpose of the cross? Same purpose it was used with Jesus. He was nailed to it. We've got to keep that old man nailed to the cross. Because if we don't keep him nailed to the cross with the power of God and the direction of the Holy Spirit, he's going to rear his ugly head every time we get a chance. he gets a chance. Keep him crucified. Keep him nailed to the cross. Keep him on that old cross. Then I've already touched on this. You've got to keep him buried. He's buried. He's gone. He's no longer there. Quit digging him up and dragging him around with you. The thing is, and this, this was the thing I liked about Paul. To walk with the newness of life and keep the old man in place, you can no longer serve sin. One of the things that impressed me the most about the Apostle Paul, and if you, you study the life of the Apostle Paul, you'll find that Paul was vehemently persecuting the church. I mean, he was doing his dead level best to get rid of Christianity. I mean, you know, he had put all these people in jail. He had went and got permission and got letters to go and outside his reason to even do it. The thing I liked about Paul, the minute Paul accepted the Lord and began to be saved, he served the Lord as hard as he served sin. That's what I liked about Paul. You know, I wished a lot of Christians would be that way. They were as faithful to serve God as they were to serve sin. They were as faithful to go to the place of God as they were to go to the places of sin. I wish they would concern and talk about 
the things of God as much as they did the things of sin, I guarantee you our world would be a whole lot better and our churches would be a lot stronger if they'd do that. We should serve God better, not as good. I, we ought to serve God better because we have so much better. The book of Hebrews is called the 12 betters. And it talks about how much better we have it with Christ. We don't just have it as good. I mean, we've got it better. Well, the things about my dad and brother J.W., we know where he, they're, both of them are. They're both in heaven. My dad's checking the floor and brother J.W.'s checking the fence rows. So we know where they are. We have that hope. And we have that promise. We can no longer serve sin. Lastly, to walk in the newness of life and spirit because we are free from the power of sin. Realize until I got saved and I had the power of Christ that dwells in me. Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth and this same power give I unto you. Until I got saved, I had absolutely no power whatsoever to defeat the devil. None. I had no power whatsoever to keep sin out of my life. I had no power whatsoever to change my want to's, my wills, and what I do. The old flesh won every time. But now, because I have that power, Jesus gave me the power through his spirit, through his word. I can now overcome those things, the power of sin. In order for me to overcome the power of sin, I need to have the instruction book. One of the things I got for Christmas this year, I got three things. And they all went out Christmas. Well, they all didn't went out Christmas. Two of them went out. I got a refrigerator, a vacuum cleaner, and a dog. Tried to put that vacuum cleaner together, and there was one little piece on that vacuum cleaner. Gary was there yesterday. There was one little piece on that vacuum cleaner. And we looked and we looked and looked. Where's that piece go? Where's that piece go? Where's that piece go? Finally, Gary said, well, I think we're going to have to get the instructions out. <laughs> and it took a while with the instructions to figure out where that little piece went. The same thing. We, we want to live for the Lord and walk in the newness of life. Guess what? There's an instruction book for it. And we can fiddle faddle around and we can fool around and try to figure it out and we can try to do it our way. But somewhere down the road, if it's going to work, folks, you've got to get the instruction book out and follow the instructions in the book. I remember one Christmas we bought a big entertainment center for the house. And me and Stephanie spent about five and a half hours using the instruction book, putting that thing together. And we got it all together and one little piece wouldn't fit. Come to find out we misread the instructions and we had to take that whole thing back apart to put this one little peg in there so it'd work. Be sure you read the instructions right. Be sure you have the right instructions. I hate instruction books now because you got to look through the Chinese, the Spanish, the Portuguese, and somewhere in that wad of book about that thick is a page of English so you can figure out what you're doing. I'm glad that my instruction book is clear and easy and simple to understand. I hate those things that says, put board B to board C and screw in holes D and put this on F and G and you're trying to find all the pieces and the parts and sometimes the boards don't have numbers and labels on them. You go, well, which one is that? God's word is real simple and real clear. People won't tell you, well, you got to be a scholar to know it. Let me tell you what you got to do with the Word of God to know it. You want to really know how to get deep into the Word of God? Just do what it says. That's all it takes. We have the instruction of the Word of God. Thank God I have guidance from the Holy Spirit. Have somebody that knows exactly what they're doing. And say, here's the way you do it. One of the things I have to do with my kids now when they want me to work on to help them with their car. I'm so decrepit, and now I can't get under work anymore. I have to sit on a stool and go, well, you put this over here, and you take that off over there, and you do it this way. You know what? That's what God's doing. The Holy Spirit, he says, I give you the Holy Spirit, a comforter and a guider. That if we'll listen, he'll say, this is where you go. This is what you need to do in this situation. This is how you fix this problem. 
of course, me, when I was that way, and people were telling me what, how to do it, I'm one of them people who don't like to tell, I don't like people telling me how to do something. I didn't want to listen. Well, I can go back through my life, and you probably can too, a, a hundred situations, you can go back and go, I wish I'd listen, just listened to, to start with. Think about your spiritual life. How many times you go back and say, well, I just wish I'd have listened to God when he told me. I'd have been in a lot less trouble. I'd have been a lot better off if I'd have just listened to God when he called me to preach and said, okay, instead of fighting him for two years. He had to whoop me and put me flat on my back. I'd have been a lot better off. Same thing in your life, Christian. If you, if you just listen to when God speaks, just listen. It's not always what you want to hear, I guarantee you. It's not always what you want to do. But I'm here to tell you, God will never lead you wrong. It's always the best thing for you. Though it may seem impossible and ridiculous, it always works. Listen to instruction. Then use the power you got. I love power tools. I'm like Tim the Tool Man Taylor. The bigger and the better it is, the more faster it works, the better I like it. Do you know what? Power tools are worthless if they're not plugged into the power source. Of course, now we don't have cords on anything now. Everything's got the batteries. But you know, until you slide the battery on that thing, it's just a piece of plastic junk. And you won't do much with it. But boy, isn't it great when you plug that thing in or you put the battery in it, and it does all that work so easy. I can remember back when we had to have hand saws to cut boards with. And I'm not that old. Boy, skill saws are really nice. Uh, now they're really nice you don't have to have a cord you know you just walk down and put it. you know what until the power source is there they're worthless you know what Christians are really great and the word of God is really great and the Holy Spirit is really great but until you plug into the power source of Jesus Christ it's not worth much not worth much I also compare it to a can of paint a can of paint's is great can't believe how much a can of paint costs now Man, it's terrible. $80, $80 for a gallon of paint? Lord have mercy. And it's good paint. But you know what? As long as it's in that can, it's not worth much, is it? It's not worth anything until you apply it to the wall. The Word of God, you have instruction. You have guidance of the Holy Spirit. And you have the power of God until you apply it in your life. It's worthless. You want to walk in the newness of life this year? Apply these things I've just told you in your life. And you'll have a far better year spiritually this year. And that's, that's my prayer as a pastor for this church. What's, what's my prayer for our, and goal for our church this year? The same it's been for the last 17, almost 18 years. That we'll grow spiritually every year. That we'll be stronger in the Lord every year. We'll be closer to God every year. That's my goal and my prayer for our church this year. Let's bow our heads.